but <clears throat> okay. Right, so I have the pleasure, I mean, let me introduce Sankro. I have the pleasure of working with him this summer. Sankro is a rising third year undergrad student, which for us European one as a thing that means that he has finished the second year of his undergrad. He's starting in September in August, the third year of the undergrad. So he has still more two years to go to finish his undergraduate bachelor studies. He's double majoring in astronomy and history, like uh, classic history uh, in, at the University of Virginia in the US. Right, so he's also the president of the club, uh, of the astronomy club at UVA. So he's very engaged in these kind of activities. And uh, Sun will graduate in May, 2025. And after that, he will pursue a PhD in astronomy. So uh, uh, finally, we both would like to uh, thank the uh, IAEA directory for the support and also for letting us, you know, use the, the, the facilities and for letting us try this exciting adventure. So please, Sam, take it away and show us what you think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. <coughs> um, yeah, so like, like Ruben said, hi, my name is Sam Pro. Oh, the pin, you didn't drop the pin. Oh, yeah, I guess you made the thing in Brad. <laughs> just, just, in case, just in case you didn't know where we were. <laughs> Uh, so hi, my name is Sam Crow. I'm a rising third year undergraduate, like Ruben said, at the University of Virginia. Today, I'm going to be telling you all about the research I've done this summer as part of the I3A3S program about near-infrared observations of clustered massive star formation in the outgoing region AFGL 5180. So I'll start with the table of contents. I'll start with a brief introduction on massive star formation and the diagnostics we can use to study massive star formation, including the near-infrared and protostellar jets. I'll move into explaining our particular region, AFGL 5180, showing a wider field view of it as an introduction, and as well as presenting our data on it. I'll then show the results of our interpretation of our data, including the identification of sources, knots, and outflows in the star forming region. And then I'll end with a discussion, both on a wider view of massive star formation and what AFGL 5180 can tell us about massive star formation, and some conclusions, including the future outlook of this study, uh, other studies like it, studying jets in the near infrared, as well as some closing thoughts. So let's start with an introduction. I'll start this with an overview of massive star formation and the current uh, theoretical debates that are still unresolved about massive star formation. I will discuss some of the observational campaigns that attempt to address these discrepancies, including the SOMA survey. And then I will also discuss protostellar jets as key diagnostics of star formation and massive star formation, and why studying them in the near infrared is very useful in telling us about star formation in general. So I'd start by emphasizing that massive stars are very important throughout the universe, and they're important throughout the all stages of their lives. So in their deaths, they die in supernova, and they enrich the interstellar medium, or ISM, with metals, which, as you know, is the entire reason why all of us are here right now. Um, but even during their birth and uh, their main sequence stages, they provide immense feedback on their environments, in particular during the protostellar stages. So for example, here I show uh, a massive protostellar outflow in Orion OMC1, and this is a special type of outflow that I'll discuss more later called an explosive outflow. And I really just show it just to emphasize that these massive stars in particular have enormous amount of feedback on their environment as they form. Uh, and it's very important to understand how this feedback manifests because it tells us how star formation actually occurs. However, the process of massive star formation, especially from a theoretical standpoint, is still poorly understood. There are two main theories. The first is Tor accretion theories, which essentially pose a scaled up version of low mass star formation. Uh, as a brief overview of low mass star formation, the general idea is you start with some dense core and maybe spherical. This is an assumption, but it could be really any size. It collapses and because of conservation of angular momentum, it tends to form a disk that tends to rotate quickly and feeds a central massive protostar or a central protostar uh, in a general case. And it feeds this protostar as it accretes mass. And eventually, as it accretes more and more, this envelope dissipates, and you end up with your star that's fully formed and enters its main sequence. Uh, but in short, the observational predict prediction of this core accretion theory is that isolated massive star formation is actually possible because you can form a single, pro a single star from a single core. There are, however, also competitive accretion theories, which predict that massive star formation occurs from a more chaotic process and an accretion of gas throughout the entire molecular cloud. Instead of forming from discrete cores, instead stars compete for gas throughout the rest of the cloud. And this predicts that massive stars form uh, in conjunction with lower mass stars and at the center of clusters, where they can accrete material uh, in order to form to a high mass. 
So in short, the observational prediction of competitive accretion is that isolated massive star formation is impossible and that massive star formation must necessarily be highly clustered and constantly surrounded by lower mass protostars. So observational campaigns help us to seek a resolution between these two theories. Um, and a big observational campaign, which I will address here, is the SOFIA Massive Star Formation Survey, or SOMA. Uh, this rests on primarily on data from SOFIA, which is the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, um, which actually just recently got uh, disbanded, so rest in peace. But there's still plenty of data, at least in the archive. Um, and using observatories like SOFIA, we can do aperture photometry on massive uh, star forming regions at different wavelengths. So for example, this is going from seven microns up to 70 microns. We can use this photometry to make SEDs, like the one I showed here where we can, we can get photometry, get fluxes, and then make SEDs for sources and then fit them to radiative transfer models for massive YSOs to try to characterize these sources and understand their formation conditions. So there have been many papers in this process. Uh, papers one through four have been focused on more isolated uh, massive star forming regions. And the next papers, SOMA 5 and beyond, are focusing on massive protostars and trident regions. Uh, some of five being led by Zoe Telkamp and an add-on by uh, myself on the Galactic Center. Uh, another key diagnostic of star formation is protostellar jets. Uh, and these go hand-in-hand -hand with the mid-infrared studies, as I'll discuss on the next slides. Uh, but protostellar jets are these key diagnostics, as I say, for star formation. Um, as a brief uh, um, introduction to protostellar jets, the general picture is you have some protostar that's accreting material, and as it accretes and rotates, um, and it has these magnetic fields that channel into the central protostar, you end up generating uh, an outflow as well as a jet. And the jet is generally highly collimated and some comes from the protostar itself, uh, whereas the jet comes from the magnetic fields on the disk and is generally a wide angle outflow, although the angle of the outflows can vary. And the, as you can see from the diagram I show on the right, these outflows and jets are normally very large scale, much larger scale than the actual protostars themselves, and so they're very useful to study. Uh, which is what I will discuss now. In particular, in the near-infrared, protostellar jets can be revealed in very high angular resolution and high detail, and this allows us to study star-forming regions. Uh, so in particular, protostars themselves are often highly obscure and difficult to study, so they, be, they may be small in scale, so on the order of an AU, as opposed to the jets they power, which are normally bright and large scale, so maybe on the order of parsecs. Uh, and Near infrared wavelengths, we have a transparent and high angular resolution view into star forming regions, as well as the near infrared bands contain many uh, jet tracers, such as atomic hydrogen emission, molecular hydrogen emission, and forbidden lines like forbidden FG2 is the example I show here. And a good region to showcase both of these points is this region right here, which many of you may have already seen. Uh, this is Rho Ophiuchus, which is a star forming region about 400 light years from Earth and which uh, this image was released as part of the James Webb one-year anniversary uh, image, so it's a very a very special image for a special moment. Um, but it actually contains a lot of science and tells you a lot about uh, jets as key traces of star formation. So it points out in particular this wavelength f uh, this filter f470 narrow, uh, 4.7 microns is tracing in particular shocked H2 emission. This is molecular hydrogen emission from outflows. And you can see in this image, we have the, the red molecular hydrogen everywhere in the image, and you even have other jets everywhere. So there's one here, and there's one over here, and there's one going uh, to the left and to the right. Just to focus on one in particular, you may wonder where the actual source is that's driving, that's driving this jet, and that source is probably somewhere around here. And so you can see the jet is enormous and large scale, but the actual protostar itself is highly obscure and difficult to study. And so this illustrates why jets are very useful if we want to study star formation, because they're much more easy to observe. And so hence, this is the justification for the near infrared add-on to the SOMA survey, which I'll introduce now. So with SOMA, as I said, we use data from SOFIA and the mid-infrared. However, in the near infrared, we've recently been getting data from many observatories, including the Hubble Space Telescope, or HST, Very Large Telescope, or VLT, the Large Binocular Telescope, or LBT, and more recently, the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST. Now with SOFIA, we've already observed about 50 high mass star forming regions. And with our near infrared follow-ups, we've observed over 30 of these. So this has been a large collaboration within our research group. Uh, and with this near infrared follow-ups, we've been getting a lot more information and detail on in these star forming regions than what we can get with the mid infrared. 
So to give you a specific example of how the near infrared can in particular be a very nice complement to the bit infrared, I show one example region. This is G35.2 minus 074 north. Uh, this is in the mid infrared going from eight microns up to 70 microns. And you can see some uh, structure here, but really not much. And then if I switch over to the near infrared, then you can see we see a lot more detail in the star forming region. Uh, and I should, I should also state that this is near infrared, it's about one to two microns, as opposed to eight microns is the lowest wavelength here we have in the mid infrared. And so you can see we did a lot more detail in this protosolar jet, which you can actually see a bit of a hint of in the eight micron data, but it's really hard to tell that there's any substructure here. However, as soon as you switch over to the near infrared, you get an enormous amount of detail in the protosolar jet. And this can be used to identify the characteristics and actually characterize this region in much greater detail than you can in the, in the mid infrared. So with that introduction out of the way, I'll now introduce our specific region that formed uh, the majority of my work this summer, uh, AFGL 5180. I'll start with an uh, overview of its location, uh, some of its characteristics, some of the past data on it from the literature, as well as the present data that I'll be presenting today. So to sort of give you a wide field view of where this region actually is, I'll start in the constellation of Ophiuchus, which is actually where Rho Ophiuchus is that I showed on a couple slides previous. You can also see the galactic center in the constellation Sagittarius. Now I can pan over to the constellation of Gemini, uh, in which AFGL 5180 is actually located and is actually just about opposite of the galactic center. And now I zoom in and now what I'm showing you is the Gemini OB1 association, which is a star forming region in the constellation Gemini in the visible. Now you really can't see much in the visible, but if we turn on the lights, then in the near infrared, and this is Spitzer, you see, we see a lot more detail. We see a giant dust ridge, and we also see this extended green structure in the middle. Now I can actually zoom in on this green structure, and this is actually our region, AFGL 5180, uh, and Spitzer again, but I can overlay the data that we have here, that I'll present here from LBT, and you can see that we get a lot more detail in the star forming region than we can see in the Spitzer wavelengths. Uh, and this is where our data starts on the AFGL 5180. Just to give an overview about some characteristics of AFGL 5180, it's at a distance of about two kiloparsecs from the sun, and this is constrained using uh, distances to Gaia stars. It is part of the Gemini OB1 star forming complex, as I just mentioned. Um, it's the source of a bright uh, class two methanol maser, which is generally strongly associated with massive star formation. So we think it's a massive star forming region. It's also a strong source of multiple sites of water maser emission, which is generally associated with star formation. And in general, previous studies suggest the presence of multiple outflows being driven by multiple sources. However, all of the previous studies suggest that more higher resolution data is needed in order to better characterize this region. And that's what we're attempting to provide with this study. So I'll start with some presentation of the data, uh, starting with the Large Binocular Telescope, which some of you may not be familiar with, uh, the Large Binocular Telescope, or LBT. So it's located in, um, on Mount Graham, a big mountain in Tucson and Arizona in the US. It has two 8.4 meter, 8 meter mirrors, and they're about 14.4 meters apart, hence why it's a binocular telescope, because it has two mirrors. Uh, we utilize near-infrared data from the LUCY instruments, LUCY-1 and LUCY-2, and these are located on either uh, on, on both of the mirrors. And then we also utilize adaptive optics, or AO, data from the SOL instrument, which is an add-on to both LUCY-1 and LUCY-2. So to show you what the data actually looks like, here is the LBT Lucy scene limited image, which I showed earlier. It has an angular resolution of about 0.5 arc seconds. And I'll point out in particular in this RGB, the red is tracing molecular hydrogen emission from molecular H2, which is a very strong uh, tracer of protostellar outflows. And so you can see already we have a lot of jet knots that characterize this region just from looking at the RGB. But we'll get more into the detail of how we characterize those later. Zooming into the central region, we also have adaptive optics data in this white box that I show here. Uh, this is with the same color scheme. Again, the red is from molecular hydrogen tracing outflows. And you can see that we achieve an angular resolution of about 0.09 arc seconds or 90 milli arc seconds. And in comparison to the James Webb Space Telescope, the fraction limited resolution of 80 milli arc seconds at this wavelength, you can see that with adaptive optics, we're actually approaching the diffraction limit of James Webb from the ground, which is really quite amazing. We also utilize data from the Hubble Space Telescope, and this is using the Wide Field Camera 3 instrument in the near infrared. Again, I'll point out in this RGB image that the red is tracing uh, forbidden FE2 emission, 
what is tracing more highly energized uh, outflow tracers. So for example, there's a few faint knots you can see here and off to here, and all the red in this image is tracing in particular uh, forbidden FV2 from energetic jets. <clears throat> Um, and then we also utilize data from the archive from ALMA in band six and seven for the YSR identification. So we're using both near infrared and radio in conjunction. Um, so with that out of the way, I'll new, now move on to some results, including the identification of sources uh, from the ALMA data, the identification of knots and jet features in the region from our near infrared data. And then in particular, I will highlight uh, from the near-infrared knot identification, the power of the LBT adaptive optics and providing uh, intricate details in the substructure of a massive protocellar jet in AFGL 5180. So in terms of our source identification, we identify over 14 compact YSO candidates using our ALMA data, uh, like I show here on the right. And we use the, we, we do the source identification using Dendrogram. Uh, for some of you may be already familiar with Dendrogram, for those of you who aren't, it's a hierarchical clustering algorithm, which essentially identifies orders of substructure within your image. So you start with a trunk, which is your lowest order of substructure, and then you move up to branches. And the branches eventually end in leaves, like I show here. And the leaves are your highest order substructure that can't be broken any further down into um, further substructure. So generally, we identify the sources as the leaves of the dendrogram, as I show here, and also in our image. And so when we actually run dendrogram, then we identify all of these as our sources. So when we run this dendrogram source finding on our region, we find that YSO candidates are grouped in two main clusters, and I call them AFGL 5280 main and south. So here they are, here's AFGL 5280 main and AFGL 5280 south down here. Um, and what's interesting and what's nice actually to see is that both of these regions correspond with methanol and water maser emissions. So in particular, AFGL 5280 main corresponds to strong methanol maser emission, as I mentioned previously, which is indicative of massive star formation. And AFGL 5280 south corresponds with multiple detections of H2O masers, which then indicates star formation activity. Um, we also identify jet features from the near-infrared data. And as I say, we identify about 40 of these, uh, primarily from the molecular hydrogen data from Large Binocular Telescope, but also from the forbidden FE2 emission from HST. So again, here is the LBT seen limited data. I'll show one knot in particular, which may be as a good example. Uh, this is what the knot looks like more zoomed in. We, had, we characterize the knot by sampling the local standard deviation or sigma and then generating what I call significance maps of the knot and the continuum subtracted images that we generate with the data. So for example, here I show contours going from three to 15 sigma above the local background in steps of two. And as you can see, this knot is significant to about nine sigma or so, which means that it's a very strong detection. And so this is how we actually characterize the jet knots in this region. And we use that to, pl to you know, place constraints and characterize what the outflow content is here in a more quantitative way. So to give you a sense of the large physical scales at play here, I'll now discuss uh, the, what we call the southern bow shock, which is this guy right here that I show a more zoomed in picture. And you can see this bow shape here which seems to trace back to the central outflowing region, which leads us to believe that it is being uh, emitted by the central outflowing region. And so a distance of about two arc minutes or four light years away from the central outflowing region. And to put that in perspective, uh, four light years is also the distance between the sun and the closest star to the solar system, Proxima Centauri. And as an interesting analogy, uh, because knots and rockets travel at about 100 kilometers per second, if you took a rocket, and you flew it all the way from the sun to Proxima Centauri, it would take you about 10,000 years. And so this gives you a rough estimate of what we call the kinematic age of our bow shock, which is the idea of if this bow shock was emitted, how long did it take if it's traveling at about 100 kilometers per second to get where it is now? And this gives us actually a lower limit on the age of the central protostar because it had to have been at least that old in order to have emitted that knot when it was still very young. I should also emphasize that this is important to us because these objects are still very young. And so these time scales, such as 10,000 years, although it seem, may, may seem very small on a cosmic time scale, can actually help us place important constraints on the order on uh, the nature of star formation in this region. Now that I've given you a sense of the large scale, I can also give you a sense of the small scale. Um, and in particular, I will highlight what the uh, LBT adaptive optics data from the SOL instrument reveals about a massive protocellar jet in AFGL 5180. So again, I will show the LBT adaptive optics data as I did when I presented the data. 
Here is our massive protostar, which we identified using dendrogram. And you can already see that it's powering a massive jet off to the, uh, the east or to the left of this image. But if I zoom in in particular on this, what appears to be this large H2 shot here, you can see that in our uh, jet feature significance maps, we see an enormous amount of substructure in this very tiny region of our data using uh, LBT, AO, and H2 molecular hydrogen, as well as HST forbidden Fe2 emission. And this is extremely high resolution, 90 milli r second resolution data from LBT AO that enables the identification, as you can see, of several sub knots within this uh, main shot that are very significant. Um, and finally, I would point out again just how small scale we're talking about here. The scale bar is 5,000 AU or 2.5 r seconds, which at a distance of two kiloparsecs is a very small scale to be able to characterize the specific jet features in this massive protostellar jet. Uh, so it's, re it's really an incredible data set. It's, it's truly cutting edge data. So as a summary, the near infrared data indicates the presence of several outflows and jet knots in AFGL 5180, both in the molecular H2 data, as well as in uh, the forbidden Fe2. And these knots are being powered by what seems to be several ALMA sources that cluster in two main regions, AFGL 5180 main and AFGL 5180 south. So with those results presented, I'll now move on to a discussion. Uh, I'll start with some interpretation of the results I've just presented. Uh, then I'll talk about some implications of the results in AFGL 5180 on star formation uh, as a whole. And then I will end with a discussion of the wider region and the Gemini OB1 association, placing AFGL 5180 in the context, discussing some of the discussions about uh, the origins of star formation in AFGL 5180. And I will end with a discussion of extended green objects, of which we believe that AFGL 5180 is actually one of them. So let's start with a broad question. What is actually happening in AFGL 5180 and what can our data tell us about what's happening in AFGL 5180? One thing that we can't necessarily exclude is the possibility of an explosive outflow. And again, I would show this image that I showed in the beginning of the presentation of this explosive protostar outflow in Orion OMC1 coming from a massive protostar. Uh, this is a special type of outflow that have only really been recently characterized in the literature. And what distinguishes them is that instead of having a collimated jet coming out in one direction, you instead have an omnidirectional jets emanating in all directions. And as I showed in the data previously, it seems like in AFGL 5180, we do have a lot of jet knots going out in a lot of directions. So it seems like this may be a viable interpretation, but because of the number of ALMA sources we have, and because of the number of sources and the high degree of clustering we find, we instead favor the interpretation of multiple outflows being driven by multiple sources. Uh, so here I show another region. This is an uh, infrared dark cloud, G28.37 plus 0 0.07. This is some ALMA data really just to illustrate the presence of many outflows driven by many sources. And this is something that's supported in the literature and that we may be seeing something like this in AFGL 5180. So that raises the question of which sources are driving which outflows, which is the logical thing you might ask if we want to uh, characterize this region. And while in short, uh, with the current data, it's, there's some uncertainty in attributing not to specific sources, simply just because the region is too crowded. Um, however, with proper motions, we'll be able to better characterize the knots and actually be able to trace them back to specific sources better, because if you can see the knots move, you can trace them back to which sources they're actually coming from. Uh, and for more study about this, my advisor, Ruben Fedriani, is, is uh, preparing a study uh, that actually has proper motion data using two epochs of HST in AFGL 5180. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Maybe he'll give another talk about that. So who knows? Um, so I'll now talk about the implications of our results in AFGL 5180 on massive star formation as a whole. So as a review, because it may have been a while, there are these two main theories, core accretion and competitive accretion. Uh, the observational predictions that I mentioned is that core accretion predicts that isolated massive star formation is possible, though not necessarily that massive star formation always occurs in an isolated fashion, I should point out. Uh, and competitive accretion predicts that isolated massive star formation is impossible and that massive star formation must necessarily be highly clustered around lower mass sources. So that raises the question, which do we actually see in AFGL 5180? And can it actually help us to resolve some of these theoretical uh, disputes in massive star formation of which model may be correct or what the true picture is? So in order to place constraints on that quantitatively, we can make plots like this. What you're seeing is a plot of stellar density, which is two-dimensional stellar density, but it's projected onto the plane of the sky versus radius. And so we actually sample in this study the radius away from the central massive protostar, which I showed earlier, 
uh, at radii of 0 0.05 parsecs up to 0 0.2 parsecs in steps of 0 0.05. Um, and so you can see that, and we compare this to these blue dots, which are from uh, star formation simulations uh, with competitive accretion models by Drudich et al. 2022. Uh, these are star forward simulations that simulate star forming regions uh, and give some prediction about the clustering of lower mass protostars around a central massive YSO of 55 solar masses. And so you can see in particular at a small radii, so at 0 0.05 parsecs, the uh, amount of stellar density from this study actually approaches that predicted by the competitive accretion simulations. And so the bottom line of this is that the, the degree of clustering that we see in AFGL 5180 around the central mass of quarter star may suggest that a competitive accretion model applies here. However, like I said, this is not necessarily set in stone, but this is one indication from the data that we do see a high degree of clustering. Um, I will now uh, move on to placing the AFGL 5180 more into context in its wider region. Um, in particular, I'd like to talk about the Gemini OB1 association, which is this giant star forming region that you're seeing here, in which AFGL 5180 is a part of, like I showed uh, when I introduced the data. And, and this red box uh, for, for reference is the uh, field of view of the LBT scene limited data that I showed earlier. So we have another star forming region to the south, AFGL 6336S, as well as a massive uh, star, an O9.5 type star, CGO115. And as you can see, there appears to be this large dust ridge on which both AFGL 5180 and this other star forming region are sitting. And so this raises the question of is massive star formation in AFGL 5180, uh, could it have been triggered by feedback from a massive star? This is what we see in the image, but is this the actual uh, correct interpretation? Now, this isn't the only interpretation that's been made of uh, massive of how star formation started in AFGL 5180. There's also been postulation of a cloud-cloud collision. Uh, so I show observational data here, as well as simulations that support the idea that cloud-cloud collisions can produce star formation on the left. Um, on the right, I show observational data from this paper, Mady et al. 2023, showing both that both AFGL 5180 and AFGL 6366S sit on this prominent blue shifted ridge that's right adjacent to a prominent red shifted ridge. And so if you think about the 3D aspect of it, you may indeed be seeing one component that's coming towards you, another component that's going away. And that may indicate that star formation is occurring in AFGL 5180 as a result of a cloud cloud collision. Now, this is still a, an unresolved question. Um, and we're still yet to figure out how our data specifically fits into this wider picture and what it can tell us about star formation and how it began in AFGL 5180. However, it is an interesting question to consider, and it can tell us a lot about how star formation, and in this case, massive star formation, normally gets started. Uh, I will now talk about extended green objects, or EGOs. Um, to introduce this, I would point out, again, as I showed earlier, the Spitzer Glimpse RGB image of AFGL 5180. And very prominently, you can see this bipolar green structure that extends on both sides of the main cluster. Um, and this also corresponds with the main outflow structure we see in both LBT and HST. Uh, this is this green emission that comes from Spitzer 4.5 microns that corresponds with our outflowing uh, structure that we see in the near infrared from 1 to 2 microns. So this seems to indicate that AFGL 5180 is actually an extended green object or EGO that hasn't been discovered previously in the literature. So we think we've made a new discovery here. Uh, to explain what EGOs actually are, they're a class of objects, like I said, they're associated with this excess emission at Spitzer 4.5 microns, and the reason why it has this excess is because this 4.5 micron filter in Spitzer contains emission lines from shocked molecular hydrogen, H2, in um, particular at about 4.7 microns. Um, so this is interesting because these, this, uh, we also trace hydrogen emission lines at 2.12 microns with our LBT data. And so this seems to indicate that we're seeing this outflow both at about 4.7 microns with Spitzer and at about 2 microns with LBT. Now, these EGOs are also correlated uh, with outflows, like I said, tracing the shot H2 emission, as well as methanol masers and massive star formation. And as I mentioned during the introduction of this region, these are all characteristics that we see in AFGL 5180. Um, I just I would say that uh, this, this does seem to corroborate the idea that AFGL 5180 has all these features, like I said, and also that these are general characteristics of EGOs because we have this, this cross-matching component where we do have a very prominent EGO and it is associated with all these things that we already know to be true about AFGL 5180. 
So I'll now move on to some conclusions, uh, including the future outlook of this study and other studies in the near infrared with outflows, some closing thoughts, and a summary. So in terms of future work with AFGL 5180, I guess I would address the elephant in the room, uh, spectra. And yes, we do have spectra, both launch slit with LBT as well as integral field unit or IFU with VLT or the uh, very large telescope. With, with the spectra, we can do a lot of things that we can't do with the imaging, like kinematic and dynamical analysis, analysis of the shock tracers, so atomic hydrogen and molecular hydrogen, like I've mentioned previously, uh, as well as forbidden FE2, which has been prominently we've been using with HST. And it will also allow us to get actual characteristics about the outflow, so that it's direction, speed, mass, temperature, and, and things like that. Um, so really stay tuned, because we haven't actually got cracking into the spectra yet. Uh, this is something that I'll be working on in the coming months. However, based on the basis we already have and the amount of detail we've gotten into the star forming region, I expect that the spectra will reveal even more about the true conditions of star formation in this region. I'll also talk about the future outlook of outflows, in particular in the era of the James Webb Space Telescope. So you may wonder what actually happens when you point JWST near cam at a massive star forming region, and what do you see? Well, you see something like this. Um, this is SH284, which is a massive star forming region. Uh, it's also a low metallicity region at about 4.5 kiloparsecs. And you can see, I point out this red emission, which comes from F470 narrow, which is 4.7 micron emission, which is also responsible for the EGOs that I mentioned previously, um, coming from shock molecular hydrogen. And so you can see these enormous prominent uh, jet knots coming out from either direction from this massive cluster in the middle. And you can see an enormous amount of substructure in the outflows here. Uh, so with our group, we have many, uh, a few uh, James Webb Space Telescope near cam proposals. Uh, this one I show is from a Cycle 1 proposal on SH284 with the PI of uh, Yu Chang. We also have two Cycle 2 programs, one looking at the SOMA sources, IRAS 07299 and G339.88 minus 1.26 with the PI of Yi Chen Zhang. And then finally, we have a program looking at the massive uh, protostar G359.44 minus 0.102 um, in Sagittarius C, which is a massive molecular cloud in the galactic center on which I am the principal investigator. So to give a little bit more detail about this last program, um, this is capturing protostellar outflows potentially in the galactic center with James Webb Space Telescope. So as an introduction to this region, this is Sagittarius C, which is a massive star forming region in the galactic center. This is our main massive protostar, G359.445 minus 0.102. I'm showing this in the mid infrared and Sophia forecast 37 microns. However, in the literature, we also see a lot more substructure in this region. So in the middle, I show this is an RGB from Spitzer from Lou et al. 2021. First of all, it points out that our massive protostar is actually another EGO. So it's quite neat that we, we do see this again in the, in the galactic center. Um, However, from this molecular line data, this is SIO 5 to 4, we see many other outflows in this region that are all within our field of view of James Webb near cam. Uh, the particular program is uh, program 4147, a sentence of low and high mass star formation in a galactic center molecular cloud. Uh, we have many science goals. One of them is to place constraints on the initial mass function or IMF in this region, uh, because if we can resolve down to lower mass protostars, which we hope to do with near cam, then we can populate the IMF down to the lower mass end and hopefully place constraints on how it manifests in this more extreme region to see if it actually varies based on what a traditional IMF may predict. However, another science goal that we have is to trace outflows. And in particular, we'll be observing Sagittarius C with both F212 narrow, which is tracing 2.12 uh, micron emission from shot molecular hydrogen, which I've been mentioning a lot from LBT that I've been working with this summer as well as 4.7 micron emission tracing shot hydrogen uh, from outflows, which is also what F212 narrow is doing. Um, and so with both these focus combined, I'm very optimistic that with some of these outflows that we already see from the literature, that we'll see them in much greater detail with James Webb. However, the data hasn't been taken yet, uh, but it will be soon, so stay tuned. Uh, finally, I'd like to give a thank you to the uh, Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia for hosting me here this summer, as well as the I3A3S program that Ruben introduced at the start of this talk. Um, of course, I've been around Granada a lot, but I've also been able to get out and see Spain uh, as a whole. So I've been to Sevilla, I'll show some pictures now, uh, Cadiz, I went to Cordoba, uh, went outside of the country as well. So I got to go to Lisbon and even went uh, to Africa, went to Marrakesh. Uh, of course, while I was in Spain, I have to try the food. So, you know, I have some Amoni, Amoni Berico, which is 
amazing, of course. This is actually this is at the IRM 30 meter telescope. They they're very uh they have a great hospitality. Um, of course, Paella is amazing. Uh, gazpacho is another staple, you know, and special from Andalusia. Actually, I'm like addicted to this stuff. I've been having it like like two times every day. It's so good. I'm gonna miss it when I go back to the U.S. because they don't they don't have it in the U.S. Um, but of course, you know, I stay true to my roots, and sometimes you know I want to have some KFC because you know uh, sometimes you just want to have some fast food. Uh, but of course, I've also gotten around to see some of the city and uh, doing some things with uh, the institute. So of course we had uh, the San Juan Festival, which which I hope uh, many of you were at, uh, which is amazing. The giant fire and fireworks, and then running into the the freezing water at midnight to uh, get good luck for the new year. Uh, we went to the IRAM 30 meter telescope at 3,000 meters in the Sierra Nevada. So we got to meet the the director over here and um, got to go up into the telescope and see all the inner workings and the instruments and everything. Uh, and then of course I also got to see Granada by myself, and I went to the Alhambra, and it was beautiful and went to Sacramonte and uh, walked around the city center, saw the cathedral and all these things. It's really been a beautiful, beautiful city, even though, of course, it was it was nicer in May when I got here. It was a lot less hot. <laughs> um, so I'd like to really just say thank you for everyone who made uh, me feel welcomed here and who made it possible for me to be here, you know, um, especially for people who, you know, fill out the paperwork and all the administrative things that had to be done to make it possible for me to be here. I know that there's a lot of that. Um, and I'd also like to give a special thank you to Ruben, my, my great advisor, uh, who has been with me through this entire process and without whom really this whole thing wouldn't have happened at all. Um, Ruben is great and motivated and helpful, but also nice and compassionate and caring. Um, and not only a, a great mentor, but also a great friend throughout this entire process. And, um, you know, always has patience with me as well when I go to his door for the 10th time every day to, to uh, ask him about something. <laughs> um, so I'll end with a brief summary um about the research uh so massive star formation theory is split between these core and competitive accretion models as i mentioned at the beginning the observations try to seek a resolution in particular the soma survey uh protostellar outflows are key diagnostics of star formation and they're best seen in the near infrared uh i presented data on afgl 5180 with cutting edge near infrared data from lbt and hst which reveals many jet features, along with uh, data from ALMA, which reveals many YSOs in this massive star forming region. Uh, I presented some of the some of the jet knots, in particular, emphasizing the amazing 90 milli arc second resolution we get with LBT adaptive optics, which reveals intricate substructure in a massive protostellar jet. And then I ended with discussing the cluster intermassive star formation AFGL 5180, and that it seems to correspond with core, uh, competitive accretion models. And finally, that the Spitzer glimpse data reveals that AFGL 5180 is actually one of these extended green objects or EGOs, which corroborates the presence of outflows, massive star formation, and methanol maser emission. Uh, so the bottom line, if I can show the bottom line, let's see. Why don't you work? The bottom line is that near infrared observations of massive protostellar jets are very important for addressing observational constraints and studies of massive star formation in particular, and characterizing these star forming regions in intricate detail. So thank you all very much, and I will take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Sam, for this really nice seminar. And uh, now the, the floor is for questions, so does anybody have? Any question? Please go ahead. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much for the seminar on the liquid WhatsApp. You almost made me cry with the description of the web. Thank you. Absolutely. Really. So uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, something that uh, you showed before. Uh, it was this slide uh, where you have this model of, uh, uh, of this uh, competitive wind. But uh, every uh, yeah. Um, let me go back a bit. You have a plot of uh, 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 a comparison between uh, between the simulation and the, yeah. Yes, this guy. Okay. Yeah, that one. Yep. So over there is these blue dots mm -hmm. are a simulation, right? Yes. And the and the red ones are your measurement. Yes. From uh, from this study. So mm -hmm. does it mean that uh, you're ruling out? This model, and you're favoring the other one that you presented in the in the previous. You, you presented two models, right? In the previous yeah. Time. So so yeah. So th this is for competitive accretion. So I guess you're asking if we can rule out core accretion based on this, which is the the single core leads to single star model. 
Uh, is, is that what you're asking? Yeah. So, <clears throat> is there still room for for this model of a competitive accretion to explain this uh, uh, to explain this case, or with this are you ruling it out? Yeah. Actually. Um, yeah, so, so so this would seem to support competitive accretion actually, but core accretion, which is the which is the more isolated massive star formation model, I wouldn't necessarily say that we can rule it out because I, I mentioned briefly that in core accretion we can still have clustered massive star formation. Um, but I think the key observational difference is that with competitive accretion we don't have isolated massive star formation, but if it's clustered, it may be a bit harder to distinguish between the two. But this was just to point out that the simulation, which uses competitive accretion sort of as its basis, does seem to align with our observational data. But I, I, I don't think I would be confident enough to say that we can rule out core accretion based on this. You know, of course, it, it, it's there's still some some uh, room for interpretation. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Right. I have a question relating to Ruben's question. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this very it's a great pleasure to see a seminar for a very young astronomer. Mm -hmm. uh, when I did my thesis 20 years ago, there were two theories to form massive stars. The first one, by collision. To form, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, stars with a mass of 20, 30 solar mass. And now, the competitive ambition. Perhaps this is a difficult question, but would you allow the collision scenario to form massive stars mm -hmm. uh, based on the input data, especially the events where space explore data or the discovery of multiple probes? Would you allow mm -hmm. that scenario to form the, let's say, the more massive stars? Yeah, so I, I mean, I'm a bit more unfamiliar with the collision model, but you're saying that massive stars could form from low mass stars that collide with each other over time. Yeah, I mean, I, it, I think it would be difficult to distinguish that, I think, in this case, because I just observation, you'd expect to see a lot of clustering with a collisional model, and you might just see a lot of clustering, but then it might be difficult to tell, are the protostars colliding, or are they accreting competitively at the same time, or like, how can you observe that? So I think, in particular, with all with the data I present here, it will be difficult to distinguish between, for example, competitive accretion versus collisional, because unless you can actually see protostars collide with each other, um, I just I'm, I'm trying to think through my head on, on how you'd actually see that observationally. Um, but yeah, I, I don't I don't think it would necessarily be ruled out, especially because of these high stellar densities. Like I said, um, I don't know if collisions or it could be strong tidal interactions or things like this. So then I think you're kind of blurring the line between collisions and competitive accretion, if that makes sense. But the fact that we are detecting multiple problems, perhaps mm. it could rule out collisions because we do not expect to see our dogs and this scenario. Mm -hmm. They will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. perhaps. I don't know. I just right. think about it. Right. Thank you, Mara. Does anybody else have any other questions? <coughs> <laughs> so you showed some very nice picture uh, of the multiple calculus uh, mm -hmm. in the massive star formation. And these multiple outflows have different orientations. Mm -hmm. um, do you think these orientations, orientations are completely random or are there some preferred uh, orientation related to maybe the role of the global magnetic field in that? Can you take mm -hmm. that? To, in, in terms in terms of the magnetic fields, no, we haven't checked that. But it is an interesting question to think about: Could the jets be channeled along some directions more preferably than others? I think the one thing that that we have been considering, probably earlier in the project, when we had when when we had identified less sources, was trying to attribute knots to specific outflows. So it's sort of uh, maybe if I can show our image, for example. We can draw lines. We can try to draw lines that connect back jet knots to specific sources. So, for example, this is AFGL 5180 South. So we can say, okay, maybe this outflow is coming from this some of these sources. But after we identified so many more sources, we say, okay, now it's really impossible to say which outflow comes from which source. So I guess the one thing we can do is to try to draw lines. But of course, we like to draw lines, and you know they're not always accurate when we when we draw lines back to, to try to trace things back. Um, but yeah, in, ter in terms of channeling along specific directions, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I would I would be inclined to say magnetic fields. I'm not sure if they act over these large spatial scales. Like I said, like uh, from the, from this distance down to the Beauchamp is about four light years. 
So I'm not sure if magnetic fields in particular can act on those large scales enough to channel those, those uh, outflows, but yeah, it's something to consider. Thank you. Again? Thank you, Sam, for this nice, this nice summary of the of the region and of the jets and of flows in, in massive protostars. It is impressive that that uh, so young people person is able to, to make uh, some good summary. Thank you. Uh, uh, my, my question, and perhaps I missed it uh, at some point because I, I, I got a phone call. Mm -hmm. uh, did, you, did you consider it? To study the deep region in the radio continuum because it's a very powerful uh, tool to identify the uh, origin of the jets because the emission comes from for a few tens of a year from the from the star and then you can more easily than through other methods identify which jet corresponds to each protostar. Yeah, so as I introduced, we do actually have continuum data from ALMA. So we have band six and seven data. No, I mean in the centimeter. Oh, and, and centimeter. Initial, right, so, so to, even, to even the radio jet, not, not the dust, the, the, oh. the jet itself. So you are also in the jet in the near infrared. It's right. Much better than the optical and better than the far infrared because you have a lot more mm -hmm. angular resolution. But in the radio continuum, you work both. The, mm -hmm extremely high angular resolution and the capability to go to the very origin to go deep inside the, these star clouds where the protostars are forming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I don't think we have centimeter data, though this could be something we could propose and try to get. Um, though I guess in general, even for the ALMA data that we had, for the scope of the project, we wanted to focus on the near infrared, in part because Ruben is a near infrared guy. So, you know, <laughs> we, we want to we want to do the science, we know we can do well. Um, but it actually it would be very nice, I think, based on what you say, to, to look at the longer radio wavelengths because that might corroborate the results that we already have in the near infrared and help us place constraints, especially with things like proper motions on um, which outflows are being driven by which sources. So no, I just in short to answer your question, it's not something we've really looked into, but it would be very nice to. Yeah, it's a selling component. You have here a lot of people who know a lot mm -hmm. on, on this topic, and you can take a bunch of advantage of, of this. Mm -hmm. and, and, and another question is related with uh, my opponent, the just another question. The, the traditional view is that the, the collisions destroy the disk and therefore they destroy the pollinated the flow. So mm. if you are observing a jet, it means that the system in some way has been unperturbed. So, so it has a very uh direction. However, you mentioned it that you got dynamical time for, for the jet mm. of the order of 10,000 years or mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. But then you were, you were using the velocity of the jet of the order of 100 kilometers mm. per second, which is quite typical for low mass stars. You, you know, the, the ejection is of the order of the, uh, of the, um, the, gra the gravitational, the free fall velocity mm -hmm. of the same order that uh, the, the minimum velocity you, you need to, to release something from the gravitational field. So the, the velocities in massive stars are more higher, mm -hmm. probably, there are observations that I show that they can reach 1,000 kilometers per second. Wow. So mm -hmm. your dynamical ages move from 10,000 years pro to 1,000 years. Mm -hmm. So the jets can have probably of the order of 1,000 years. So you can have a collision and you can melt, you can uh, combine two or several low mass stars and you destroy the bees and the jets, mm -hmm. but then there is time still mm -hmm. to make another this and another jet. Mm -hmm. So these jets maybe can be like the second generation jets. Mm -hmm. So in this way, you, you can combine both things. So and, and also maybe this can explain this kind of misalignment because mm -hmm. you, you got jets in all directions. There is not there are some regions where you have a clear magnetic field and 
and uh, they're just tend to be ordered along the magnetic field. And of course, the very important element to launch, otherwise mm -hmm. there is no no explanation to to make it here. But if you combine several things, you then you can get misaligned jets and you can get massive stars. And just this is a common that maybe you can consider this possibility in the future if you get more data than and contribute to to focus your your interpretation mm. yeah thank you for pointing that out actually while you were talking it made me think that um i guess as you mentioned that this this bow shock the ages i just the ages are really more suggestions i'd say than estimations i wouldn't even say it's an estimation because assuming 100 kilometers per second could depend on a lot of things like you say um, but we also don't even know if this came from a lower mass or a higher mass protostar because, like I said, it could trace back to AFGL 5180 South, which doesn't appear to be massive star forming, or main, which could be, which seems to be massive star forming. But even if it's from AFGL 5280 main, it could have come from a massive protostar, a low mass protostar. We don't really know. Um, but if it is from a massive protostar, because it is actually very bright, then it could be that this was ejected longer ago. Longer ago Maybe there was some collision, it broke the jet, and then now you have a newer jet which is going east-west from a massive protostar. It's a, it's a potential explanation that just popped into my head, but thank you for that. Do we have a question? On? There is a question soon. Okay. By Hans Sinecker. So Hans, if you can open your microphone. Oh, yeah. Good morning from Chile. <laughs> Hi. Morning. Hi, Sam. Very nice talk. Great talk. Um, two points. The first is that uh, competitive accretion. I mean, I, I would like to um, uh, tell you that uh, I was actually the one who invented this, this theory and this term, and I'm one of the et al. in the Bonnell et al. Mm -hmm. And um, it goes back to my thesis in 1982. So that's one comment. And uh, it's also described in, in my paper in the annual reviews with Harold York, 2007. That was my uh, personal reference, sorry. <laughs> and the other point is about the future with JWST. Uh, when you have all these jets, then also that we have to have disks. So do you have any plans to, discuss, uh, to discover the corresponding disks say with Miri in the mid infrared by an infrared excess or maybe Alma? Hmm. Yeah, I, I think I think that would be sort of the next logical step, especially for regions where we have the very high angular resolution James Webb data. Um, I just in short, yes, I mean, if, if we get the data. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just, I just we um, in particular, like we, we have in our program um, water emission, I think it's from F-187, 1162 medium band. Yeah, which yeah, you, might, you might want to follow up with MIRI observations to de detect an mid infrared excess or something, just like Charlie right. Lyle did earlier with the ground based observations. Right. I mean, if we can get the data, <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> I'd love to. Maybe you can make for another proposal. Um, and also, thank you for mentioning the, the, yes. uh, the, the competitive accretion thing. I just Part of my uh, indoctrination in, into astronomy is learning all of these things I, that I don't know about the the history of things. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, but but the the protostars and planets review in two thousand seven gives a good account. But also I refer mm -hmm. you to in the same year there is this uh, annual reviews article bit by myself and Harold York, which is also a good source of information in this context. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Thank you. Have fun. Keep having fun. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Is there any other questions here? Please go ahead. Just on the final. We, when they would fall on the man, we can find the FGS camera. Oh, my God. Oh. oh. Okay. <laughs> I was on it. So that's, the, that's where the name comes from. What is it actually a stand for? I don't know. Air Force, like 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 military air force. Yes. Yeah. 
Ah, 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 people who don't, do not like the military origin of the world and just use GL and uh, then <laughs> so you can see in the literature the yeah. place where the eight their force <laughs> is missing. I have seen that. Yeah, sometimes it's GL fifty one eighty, sometimes it's AF GL fifty one eighty. I never knew that. <laughs> you, you know, in the past, the, the infrared was military secret. So when mm. I started my my PhD, it was not allowed for the astronomers to, to use uh, uh, easily the uh, infrared method. Right. So, and uh, by the end of the eighties or so, they they started to to be permitted to astronomers to, to use it. So okay. most of the first infrared catalogs were on a military origin. Wow. Wow. Okay, I think we need to close, so it doesn't expand too long, but thank you very much. Let's thank again Sam for the fantastic finger. Um, we're going for thousand in a few minutes. So anybody wants to join, we're gonna have plenty to, to celebrate. Okay, so you're more than welcome. Well, no,